Watch this. Idaho became the first state to ban transgender athletes from competing on the team of their chosen gender. Well, now it may become the second state to face championship consequences from the NCAA. This Nampa bar chose to reopen their business early. Well, now they'll have to choose between a $2,500 fine or the temporary loss of their license. She's spoken out against Idaho's governor before on his handling of the COVID pandemic, but is our lieutenant governor in favor of a recall effort? More than 35 years. That's how far back Boise State University's relationship goes with the NCAA men's basketball tournament. The school hosted its first first and second round games back in 1983, back when it was called the Pavilion. They've hosted eight times since, the last one just two years ago. And they're scheduled to do it again at Extra Mile Arena in March of 2021. But that plan, like a weak jumper in the paint against Hakeem Olajuwon, well, could be rejected because of a bill that Governor Little signed back in March. The National Center for Transgender Equality, along with a whole slew of others, asked the NCAA to relocate all of their events out of Idaho. And that would include the upcoming championship tournament games slated for next season. It seems like a big ask, but the NCAA, they haven't shied away from stepping into the social issue arena. And that could make this a very real possibility. The letter was sent to the NCAA today, endorsed by 60 organizations, four dozen former and professional athletes, and more than 400 collegiate athletes from across the country, including a coach and runner from Boise State. The National Center for Transgender Equality, who wrote the letter, claims the Fairness in Women's Sports Act is discriminatory. And that actually goes against NCAA policy. NCAA uh, really has explicit rules to ban discrimination so that Every young person who wants to play sports can do so. Um, but with HB 500, now that contradicts their policy. So we're asking them to move their tournaments to a place where all athletes can actually participate. Idaho may be the first state in the country to ban transgender athletes from competing as their identifiable gender, but it wouldn't be the first state to face a challenge from the NCAA because of a transgender law. After North Carolina tried to limit transgender access to bathrooms in 2016, the NCAA pulled the men's tournament games from the Tar Heel State the next year. To their credit, they took a stand when North Carolina tried to single out transgender people for harm. Um, and so that this is really uh, consistent. Asking them to get out of Idaho as long as this ban is in place is really consistent with what NCAA has done in other places because to them, they want athletes to play the sport. If you have a ban like this, then their own athletes can't even be protected from harm, even um, when they're in Idaho like this. Not that Idaho isn't trying to take care of it on its own. The Idaho chapter of the ACLU filed a lawsuit in April to keep the law from going into effect on July 1st. But if a legal approach won't work, well, then a fiscal one just might. Because this brings a lot of money into Boise in the Treasure Valley. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we really need transgender young people to feel safe and protected when they're in the care of adults. Um, and if and NCAA has an opportunity to play here, has an opportunity to really stand up for, for trans people. So um, we're really, really appreciative of everything they've done so far. We're optimistic that that they're going to come to to see what's at stake here. And yeah, absolutely. They they have a big opportunity here um, at, at the pocketbook and at public opinion to really show that trans people deserve protection from discrimination, just like any other person in Idaho. People seem to pay attention to the pocketbook. So how much money does a machine like the NCAA tournament pump into the local economy? In 2018, according to the Boise's Visitors and Convention Bureau, they booked eight hotels, 3,500 rooms, and brought in 30,000 people to the tune of around $15 million. And how effective is the NCAA when it comes to these things, maybe changing the laws or some rules? When North Carolina lost those tournament games in March of 2017 because of their bathroom law, the legislature repealed it the following month. We reached out to the NCAA and Governor Little, but we haven't heard back. Boise State did send us this, though, this statement. The school has and will continue to follow the NCAA guidance until the new state law goes into effect on July 1st, after which all Idaho universities will follow the new law. The attorney general will lead the defense of the law in coordination with the governor and legislative leadership. 
So this is still early in the process. Of course, the NCAA would be the first to make the next move and that they still have to decide. By the way, there's still a lot left that they have to figure out over the next couple of months, like even if there's going to be a football season this fall. Another issue in the national spotlight that is now slightly illuminating in Idaho, the Confederacy. Back during the start of the Civil War, as brothers fought against brothers, gold had just been discovered in the Idaho Territory, bringing thousands of people westward, hoping to strike it rich. As the territory began to grow, so did the need for religious services. And in 1872, a Methodist church opened its doors on 10th and State Streets in downtown Boise. Nearly 90 years later, in 1960, the current Cathedral of the Rockies at 11th and Hayes opened its doors. Cathedrals, known for their stained glass windows, tell the story of Christianity. And in Boise, the church says those windows, quote, historically and artistically enrich the beauty of the building while informing present and future generations of our Christian faith and our modest or our Methodist heritage, excuse me, sprinkled with a nod to our Idaho home. Well, those stained glass windows, which were actually made in Pennsylvania, also tell the story of American history, and they include the likes of George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Robert E. Lee. Yep, that Lee, the commander of the Confederate States Army during the Civil War. And with the recent unrest across the country over the killing of George Floyd and the racism wrapped up in that, that window has a lot of you talking on social media. Like this Reddit post with more than 160 comments in less than 24 hours calling for the window to be removed. There are other calls for actions out there as well. They're posted on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The stained glass is not visible from outside the church, though. We did reach out to the Cathedral of the Rockies, and a spokesman for the church says they're aware of the issue and the outcry and the timeliness of the matter. Plans are in the works to address it, and we're expecting an official announcement later this week on exactly what those plans are. That's not the only place Lee's presence can be found in the Gem State, by the way. About 40 miles northeast of Boise is the Robert E. Lee Campground in the Boise National Forest in remote Boise County. USGS lists the campground on its official website, but it is not found on the Boise National Forest website. So we reached out to the Boise National Forest for clarification. We have yet to hear back. There's also a change.org petition right now in the works to change that campground's name. And if you're wondering how Idaho came to hold remnants of Lee's legacy 2,000 miles away from Virginia, it turns out Idaho became the settling ground for Confederates after the Civil War back in the 1800s. They went weeks without speaking. In fact, the only way Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan seemed to be communicating with Governor Brad Little was through a newsletter and by showing up at Open Up Idaho rallies. Throughout the pandemic, McGeehan has been very public about her criticism of Governor Little's plan to quarantine and then reopen Idaho. And she wasn't the only one. Last week, we told you about an official campaign underway to recall Governor Little. Well, yesterday, those two were in the same room together for the first time in a long time. So after her continued criticism of the governor, would Idaho's lieutenant governor sign that recall petition? Here's Joe Paris. I'm going to ask you a simple yes or no question. Do you or do you not support the recall? Nate, I am focused on doing my job. After continued criticism of Governor Brad Little's handling of coronavirus, Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan addressed their tense relationship Tuesday on Nate Shellman's show on KBOI Radio. In the interview, Shellman references the official campaign to recall Governor Little stemming from the handling of coronavirus here in Idaho. And recall organizers tell me that they have very similar complaints to the ones McGeehan had. So the question is, does she support the recall? Here's her first answer to that question. Well, I, um, I recognize that there is a lot of anger and frustration that's out there right now. We have a lot of work to do to restore the people's face, faith in their state government, and that's what I'm committed to doing. It hasn't been just critical words from McGeehan. A few weeks back, she continued to urge Idahoans to disobey Governor Little's stay-at-home order and his phased reopening plan for the state. The lieutenant governor also attended both in-person and online rallies aimed at getting the governor to reconsider his plan. McGeehan was also very critical of the governor after a North Idaho bar received a warning from state police because they opened ahead of Governor Little's plan. In a statement to the conservative Christian site Redoubt News, the lieutenant governor said in part, the governor is using the Idaho State Police and the Alcohol Beverage Control Bureau to harass and intimidate private business in Idaho. 
Her statement went on to say that she thinks the governor's stay-at-home order and its associated enforcement are in direct contradiction to the inalienable rights of man as laid out in the state constitution. The conversation on Nate Shelman's show Tuesday continued as Shelman tried to get an answer out of McGeehan on the recall petition. I can make the question simple if you want to. If somebody hands you a recall petition and says, will you sign this, will you sign that recall Governor Little petition or not? I will not sign it. Okay. Not signing it and not supporting it, though, are different things. So Shelman clarified. Yes or no? Do you support the petition to recall Governor Little? I do not support the petition. The lieutenant governor did add, however. But I also want to encourage I, I want I want to encourage people to be engaged in the government process. And so if that's what it means for people to be activated, run for office, then then I I support that. And I applaud the people of Idaho for for their effort and for being engaged because That's what it's going to take for us to protect our great state of Idaho. Okay, so that's a very political answer, Joe. And so she does. She believes in the ballot box. That's where this all should be settled. And we mentioned they were in the room together for the first time in a long time just yesterday. Do we know anything about how their relationship, if it has improved at all? Well, the pair has uh, really kept the relationship private. Both the governor and lieutenant governor have both kind of spoken code over the last few months, really, last few weeks, talking about why their schedules haven't connected or if they've been chatting. As Brian mentioned yesterday during that AARP town hall, that was really the first time we've seen them in a room together. Beyond that, though, Brian, moving forward, it's just going to have to see what the working relationship is between the lieutenant governor and the governor. Uh, You would assume yesterday them actually being in the same room together for an event would be a good sign. And as she's mentioned before, and so is the governor, they don't always have to agree. They're not elected together. They're not on the same ticket. So they can come at things from different sides. That's perfectly acceptable. Thank you, Joe. He's come to the city of trees from the city of roses. We're hearing from Boise's newest police chief for the very first time. They were already warned, open too early, and you could face consequences. Well, they didn't listen. So will they now be paying a fine or even lose their liquor license? Grab your phones. We want to hear from you. Text us anything. Your questions, your comments, even your complaints. Yeah, we take them all. Just be careful. Some will appear on our show. Text the number on your screen, 208-321-5614. Include your name and the hashtag, the 208.
and I've been a professional police officer here in Portland, Oregon for about 20 years now. Uh, I rose through the ranks. I started out as a community police officer, risen through the ranks to serve as the assistant chief of police, both over the operations side of the organization and the services side of the organization. Um, so I'm well suited, well equipped uh, to serve as your chief of police from that professional standpoint. And Boise's new police chief, Ryan Lee, will officially take over on July 1st. Lee, as you just heard, comes from Portland, where he worked for nearly two decades. His departure comes at the at the time the Portland police is uh, gaining criticism for its handling of ongoing protests in the city. On Monday, Portland Police Chief Jamie Resch stepped down. And he's uh, Lee, by the way, is a U.S. Coast Guard veteran with a background in homeland security, terrorism and intelligence, as well as what McLean calls a long history of studying human rights and building police community relationships. As we all know, that's very important here. Back in April, Nampa Mayor Debbie Kling said the city would not be finding businesses that chose to reopen ahead of the governor's statewide reopening plan. But that declaration didn't exactly apply to the Idaho State Police, and they've apparently followed through on their threat. According to a Facebook post made by Slicks, that bar in Nampa we've told you about several times, well, the bar owner, she received a letter from ISP late last week, she says, claiming Slicks violated the stay-at-home order by reopening May 1st, nearly a month and a half before bars were allowed to reopen in Stage 3. Well, now Slicks is facing a $2,500 fine and the possibility of losing their alcohol license, or at least having it suspended. The letter states that Slicks has 21 days to decide. Are you going to take the suspension or are you going to pay the fine? Sheila says she doesn't believe any violations occurred, adding, ironically, small business gets a $2,500 fine for returning to work, while others get a $1,250 bonus. Referring to Governor Little's back to work bonus for unemployed Idahoans, and I believe it's $1,500, correct? Idaho State Police paid a visit to Slicks back in May and issued them a warning, adding that Mayor Kling has the authority to make laws more strict, but she does not have the authority to loosen those laws. Sheila says she plans to fight this violation. Other bars across the state have also received warnings that we've heard about, but this is the first actual reprimand we know of. A lot can be decided by the flip of a coin. Opening kickoff, who gets the last piece of pie, the person in charge of a precinct. Yep, a coin toss to determine another election in Ada County. And it seems tails really never fails. Is it fair to decide an election with a coin flip? Maybe you have another question you'd like to ask and have us try to answer. You can text us right now, 208-321-5614. Include your name and the hashtag the 208. We're going to get some of your questions and the comments later in the show.
Hope you certainly enjoyed this beautiful day today because temperatures were pretty close to the average. 79 is average and we got just above that. So I'll show you some of the highs here first of all. Going outside though, you see we do have sunshine for this evening and a pretty incredible evening. So I'll give you the hour by hour for tonight as well as on through tomorrow as to what you can really expect with all of this. Well, the high temperature this afternoon, we reached uh, 83 degrees. You can see that it's 83 degrees from out and home, 82 in Caldwell, 81 degrees for the high temperature in Napa, so not doing too bad. Over the northwest, I've been showing this map. This is the latest satellite map. The storm system to our northwest will cool our air down on Saturday. In the meantime, it's going to push as it comes in, air out of the south, as it always does, and then eventually form some showers and thunderstorms, I think, by later Friday night. So temperatures for today were in the 80s over the northwest. But if you look at Redding, California in northern California, you see it's 94. That's the heat that's going to be pushed into southern Idaho by tomorrow. So for this evening, you see temperatures will be in the 80s until about 9 o'clock tonight. Then it drops into the 70s. You look at tomorrow morning, low temperatures will be the lower 60s to right around 60 degrees. And then tomorrow, I've got 93 for the high. There will some, maybe some clouds. And warm in the afternoon, especially, you might see some breezes that could begin because of that storm system to our west. Not uh, strong gusty winds, but winds that could have gusts between 20 to 30 miles an hour, which I understand is bad enough. And, bad enough, and that could take place for later uh, tomorrow afternoon. They'll get a little stronger, especially on Friday afternoon. So there's 93 degrees for tomorrow, Friday 92. As the storm comes in Saturday and Sunday, there's a chance of some showers. That could begin late Friday night. As you look at Saturday, there's a chance of some showers, isolated thunderstorms, but gone by Sunday morning. Next week, we continue to warm back up with temperatures up around 80 degrees. Now, that's your weather forecast, and we've got more when we return. It is tails. All right. 
50-50 shot, that's a coin toss, right? But if you're Brock Frazier, those odds seem to fall in your favor 100% of the time. For the second time in eight years, Frazier won his election runoff. Well, not much running to do with this one. Just kind of stand there and watch the coin flutter in the air. Well, during last week's election, Carol Davey and Frazier both received 36 votes in the battle for precinct committeemen, setting up a somewhat rare winner-take-all coin flip, as you just saw. Ada County Clerk Phil McGrain let Davey call the toss, as this is the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage in Idaho. And Davey, as you heard, picked heads. The coin fell tails, giving Frazier the win. So when was the last time an election was decided by a coin flip? Not that long ago. We went back through our records. Turns out it was just back in 2017 when there were two election tie-breaking coin flips. One in Whitebird and one in Hayburn. And there was the last one there was to happen in the Treasure Valley, 2016. We'll be right back. Several comments sent in today about the NCAA and the transgender law that is on the books now here in Idaho. This one from Barb and Meridian. I don't know of a woman athlete who doesn't want trans women to be treated fairly, but the cost of treating her fairly should not come at the cost of discrimi discriminating against a biologically female at birth woman. And a lot of people might agree with you on that one. And this one is certainly different than a bathroom law in North Carolina that took place in 2016 and 2017. There's a whole lot of nuance with this that the NCAA is gonna have to take a look at as well as the lawsuit that is currently in federal court. The law is bad policy and simply embarrassing for Idaho. We can be better than this. And yeah, we're gonna get a lot of spotlight on Idaho should this go any further, should the NCAA decide to take a look at this and even say, you know what? We're taking away that NCAA men's championship tournament from you, or at least the first couple rounds next year. If they decide to do that, we're gonna have a big spotlight on the state of Idaho. Removing genitalia does not change DNA. A male is still a male physically. Yes, that's a good point, but it's not about that. It's about how somebody identifies. This one sent in from Jan. Slicks Bar was in violation of a legal health ordinance issued to protect the health of the community. They chose to ignore warnings they were in violation. $2,500 seems pretty light. Maybe they should start a GoFundMe campaign. We got a lot of people saying just leave businesses alone, however. Let them do their thing. We can all figure it out. But yeah, they're the first one that we've heard of that has taken a fine because they opened up way before phase three, which is where bars are supposed to open. This one sent in as well. 
from John. Let's just rewrite every bit of history and start over. Guess that means Sputnik and Alan Shepard never went outside the atmosphere. I don't think removing names of something or even play, uh, glass that has a picture of Robert Lee on it is rewriting history. We keep saying that rewriting history. It's kind of taking away, highlighting some of these things, celebrating them by naming statues and parks and putting them up for everybody to see. The history is still there. That doesn't change. It's whether we celebrate some of the things that happened in our past. Stop trying to erase history. Talk to Jewish survivors. You're not going to equate Jewish and Holocaust with what happened during the Confederacy. We're going to stop that right there. Hey, that Joe Paris kid is a really good reporter. That came from the area code 303. Joe, tell your mom to stop texting. <laughs>